Hello! If you saw my video last week, then you already know that I am coming to you from the future, or at least the future in relation to the rest of the content of this video. Can you say hi and stop squirming so much? Please? <laughs> you always look so alarmed. Alright, fine, down you go. I'm out of town visiting my parents right now, and it has now been a little bit since the Bridgerton event. So all of it is finished at the time of filming this, but I still want to share it with you guys. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you guys how I made Micah's tailcoat. This is the last part of Micah's costume that I made. The rest of it was just like pants and a cravat that are purchased items. So. If you haven't seen the last video, I went over the shirt and the waistcoat. This week's video is going to be covering Micah's tailcoat, and the next week's video is going to be covering my gown, uh, finally. <laughs> the pattern that I'm using for Micah's tailcoat is a, I think, McCall's pattern. Uh, it's a commercial, like, big four pattern, and it's kind of a Regency, uh, one of the Bridgerton patterns, I think. It has more of the straight cut style at the waist rather than like the slope style that you see in the first season of Bridgerton. Simon has this kind of cutaway style jacket, which is not actually like Regency style, I don't think, but it's what Bridgerton decided was going to be in the show. So because this costume was made for the Bridgerton event, I kind of took that uh, creative liberty to make it how I wanted to interpret the show. I bought all the fabric from these costumes in the LA Fabric District, and you can check out my LA Fabric shopping vlog to see that haul, but because I'm using a stretch velvet, because that was the only like affordable velvet that I could find at the time, I knew that if I just followed what the commercial pattern said to do, then it wouldn't really have the right shape. So I kind of took the pattern from the commercial pattern and then used techniques found in actual tailoring books. So let's get straight to it. Okay, so the deadline for this costume is coming up, so I don't have time to make this waistcoat and then do a fitting for the tailcoat. So we're gonna do the tailcoat right on top of the mock-up for the waistcoat and it'll be fine. Pokey. Well, yeah, it's gonna be pokey because there's no lining in there. So the way that the Bridgerton jackets kind of exist, they've done better about it in the second season where they made them a little bit more uh, like historically accurate. But in the first season, they're all just like open. They don't actually close. They don't look like they come close to closing. So that's how I've done this one because when I started this project, uh, the second season had not come out yet. <laughs> so first off, I think that the sleeves have too much in them, but I'm hoping that will resolve itself once they're made of a real fabric that isn't as like blousey. It also looks like this side fits better. I think maybe I set the seem a little bit wrong in this one. So we're just gonna ignore this side of the sleeves because this one's set correctly, this one's offset a little bit. So the bag is too large for Micah. Still, it's too big. Like you can see that there's like just too much volume back here. Can you move your arms around like forward? And we do want some of that volume because it makes it so that he can move his arms at all. So I don't wanna take much out. Uh, maybe I don't wanna take any out. Okay, put your arms back down. Yeah, I guess I'll leave it uh, just because he needs to be able to move his arms uh, since he's usually the one who carries all the stuff when we go places. So uh, we'll just leave that. The sleeve looks pretty good. It is, let's see, I have a half inch seam allowance on there, I think. So let's tuck that up. Yeah, so once that seam allowance is tucked up, it just hits like where his hand 
begins to become a hand, I guess. It's past the wrist, but you know. So I think that's good, and I think that'll be like a good length. The collar seems fine. It's not the best put together since I was rushing yesterday, but I think the collar looks correct. It looks like the Duke's collar. So mostly my inspiration came from the Duke of Hastings and from Colin Bridgerton, just because those were the two that had like the most images for their costumes. So that was kind of what I went off of. Um, but they do have really different styling. Baby. Oh, they do have really different styling because like the Duke of Hastings is supposed to be like what his character is and Colin's supposed to be this very good boy. So their styling is different, which means their silhouettes are a little bit different. So I found the Duke's more interesting because it's not strictly historical, whereas Colin's is a lot more historical. So I'm gonna be going more off of that. For the Duke's collar, he has a lot that are the high collars that get kind of buttoned down right here. So I think for that look, this looks correct. For the lapel, this is obviously just like way too large. Like the lapel shouldn't be coming out this much. And all of this canvas back here is causing some problems. Um, so the lapel is too far. It's like going past this line here, which we don't want. So I'm gonna roll this back like I did with the waistcoat and then also tuck that in there. Baby bat, why? <laughs> if it fits, she sits. Yes, you are being a bad girl. You're right. Okay, so that already looks a little bit better. I will have to smooth this line out. What? I'm thinking maybe the waistcoat is a little bit too large now that I'm looking at it underneath this jacket. Eh, maybe it's fine actually. It might be too long for you. Where's your hip? Here. Uh, I guess it's hitting about correctly. Turn that way. Yeah, so I think once all of the canvas is sitting in the right place, then it looks a little bit better. I am happy with how the jacket sweeps backwards because if you look at this picture here um the jacket is sweeping backwards at the hem so that's good got that this also is just like i want this to sit farther in here i don't know if i'm gonna have to like fake it with some kind of clip or like a pin that cements this to the jacket because like it there's just no anchor point if it's not closing in the front so like normally these would close obviously because that's how jackets normally work but through some kind of like cinema magic, they made it so that these just stay perfectly open. Um, which maybe they did that through like really clever tailoring. Um, maybe they pinned it in place, but I don't have time for all the really clever tailoring and all of the fittings that would use up. So we're gonna have to just make it and then figure something out. I think maybe the lapel is still a little bit too large. So I want it to be more like this, I think. Okay, that looks a lot better. But I think that's good. I think this looks fine and I can work with this. So let's get started on cutting stuff. Thank you. 
What do you see? like the front all nice and smooth and it's gonna look good hopefully <laughs> but till this point I've been following the instructions in this book the classic tailoring techniques for menswear basically I just followed the instructions not like quite exactly because I had to adapt it for this pattern but pretty closely so that I could get up to this point now that I am to this point I'm just going to follow the directions on the McCall's pattern I didn't want to follow the directions for the McCall's pattern for this whole thing because the stretch velvet is like really flimsy. It's just like, it's not very solid. But because I went for the budget option with the stretch velvet, it really needed to kind of be molded into a shape that would look like a jacket. <laughs> so stretch velvet obviously is not really meant for jackets. It's meant for stretch wear because it's stretch. So I kind of had to do a lot of manipulating and that's just part of tailoring also. But I had to work a little bit harder because I chose this material. And that's just kind of the trade-off you have when you go cheap on materials. It ends up costing you a lot more time. <laughs> if you use really nice materials, then it makes your job a little bit easier because you don't have to force the fabric into doing anything that it doesn't really want to. Unless you're working with like chiffon, then you're just kind of screwed. So now I'm gonna just follow the instructions for the McCall's pattern so I'm not going to do the sleeve and like all of the vents and everything like I would if this were a bespoke jacket 
The pleats, um, for one, are just a different design than from what I would do if this was just like a modern suit jacket. So that's different in itself and I will be following the instructions for that. If you want to see something that has a little bit more step-by-step -step instructions on how to do a suit, I have a video. It's kind of old at this point. Maybe not my best cinematography, but it's pretty thorough. I basically just <laughs> go through every step-by-step -step instruction from this book to make a jacket. And, but at this point, we're just following the commercial pattern and we're gonna go for it. into the cuffs because the velvet is just like really floppy and sad by itself and I didn't want to use fusible interfacing because that does end up separating from the fabric eventually and I want to make sure these cuffs stay really nice and crisp. I'm using the wool canvas. This is the same wool canvas that I used for tailoring the entire front and that'll stay really nice and crisp throughout the lifetime of this jacket. I'm also cross stitching it to the seam allowance right now so that it doesn't shift around once this jacket is put together because if I just put it in there and left it floating it might like drop out of place. So besides doing the wool interfacing in the cuff, I'm going to be doing the actual sleeve a little bit different. The McCall's pattern says to do the lining and the fabric for the sleeve completely separately. So you just install them into each of their respective layers separately and they just live kind of as separate garments and they're only attached at the wrist basically. That makes it really easy for the lining to kind of shift around and twist and be really uncomfortable inside the sleeve. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to sew these two seam allowances together so that when everything gets flipped around to the right side and they're all installed in the jacket, this has nowhere to flip around to. So like this won't slide around the arm, it's not going to be really annoying, and it's not going to get twisted. Um, it's going to make putting everything into the jacket a little bit more annoying. It does mean that I have to sew the sleeve in and then I have to hand stitch the lining of the sleeve into the lining at the arm's eye. So it does add a little bit of an extra step, but I think it's worth it because it just makes wearing it so much less irritating. I'm only gonna do this stitch around the middle part and I'm gonna leave like maybe three or four inches free at the very top where it does go into the arm's eye. Otherwise it will interfere with installing the sleeve a lot. So you wanna leave a, quite a bit of space so that you can still get this part of the sleeve into the arm's eye of the jacket.
like hey thank you guys for watching i hope that you enjoyed it and i hope you learned something maybe i don't know i feel like i learned a lot with this project i've done tailoring before but not with stretch velvet and not regency tailoring so i did use kind of modern methods to tailor this in the front and then because i was using a costume pattern i ended up just following the instructions for the costume pretty much all the way through for the back and the pleats and everything after having completed it i think that the stretch velvet needed interfacing all throughout. I was hoping that the back was like small enough pieces that it would be fine, but it doesn't hold a shape very well. It Obviously it stretches out because it's stretch velvet, um, so it doesn't conform to the body super well. And then also all of the pleats are a little bit soft. They're not really crisp like pleats should be, so I kind of wish that I had put a canvas through pretty much everything. I think it would hang a lot better. I could have also done iron-on interfacing. However, I don't typically like to use iron-on because it bubbles and peels away from the fabric over time. So uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's really good for stabilizing things while you're sewing it, but it's not good for long-term stabilization. So generally, this project I think went uh, mediocre. <laughs> it's probably my first project on this channel that I'm like not even like 70% happy with, I would probably give myself like a solid C. B plus for effort, maybe A minus, <laughs> cause I did try really hard on like getting the canvas to lay right and like making sure the front of the jacket looked really smooth and then I just kind of skipped through the end. So uh, B plus to A minus <laughs> with some points taken off for rushing through the back. That said, I'm not really happy with how it turned out. I don't think it looks great. I wish that I had put a lot more interfacing through everything. So basically from about like shoulders to side back seam, I think looks pretty good. I think all of that looks like it's supposed to. It looks crispy and nice. Um, I think that I should have pad stitched the collar canvases into the collars because they are like, I don't know, I just cross stitched them in there and they're not really tight against the fabric and you can kind of tell. So I wish that I had more solidly put that canvas in, same with the cuffs, and I wish I put canvas pretty much everywhere. <laughs> so I don't know, I'm not really happy with this result, which I don't like to make projects. I mean, nobody likes to make projects they're not happy with, but I feel always really guilty making projects that I am not happy with because then I've like wasted fabric. I don't, I mean, I don't really care that I've wasted my time. I don't feel guilty about that, but I feel bad that I've wasted a resource that, I don't know, someone else could have used or just could have not been used and not made that kind of environmental impact. So I always feel guilty because these costumes either sit in a closet or they get thrown away or they sit in the closet and then they get thrown away. So I don't know, um, hopefully, the next time I attempt a costume for Micah, it doesn't go like this. There was a couple of things that I just entirely skipped because I uh, was running low on time. The Bridgerton experience that we went to was on Saturday at like 5 p.m. or something. I cut this on Monday after I finished the waistcoat and then I spent Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday finishing this entire coat. So not only was I setting myself up kind of for failure, with uh, tailoring a stretch velvet, but I also did it all in three days, so a lot of it was rushed through, so um, it could have been better. The Friday I finished up this dress and it had a lot of lace still to go. Um, didn't even finish that. So basically what I've learned from this is I don't like tailoring stretch velvet, don't wanna do that again, and I really hate working on deadlines. Actually, that was one of the big reasons that I left theater. Um, Obviously the pandemic happened, so I couldn't work in theater after graduating. So there was that problem. But it, one of the big reasons that I didn't like theater was because of all the tight deadlines and the kind of like do or die uh, attitude about these deadlines. I also am not going to ever tailor with stretch velvet again. I will spring for the more expensive stuff. Because <laughs> even if I can get it to look nice with the tailoring part, which I think turned out fine, the actual tailoring part went fine. However, the parts that are not stabilized just look bad. <laughs> they just do. The pockets never really ended up looking quite right because it is a stretch. So it kind of is just too flimsy and too soft and it wants to bunch in on itself. As for the pattern, I think the pattern was fine. I made quite a few alterations to it and like it was fine. I think because it was a costume pattern rather than a historical pattern, it was more well suited to a modern silhouette. So I would recommend this pattern for it, uh, especially if like 
you are going for more Bridgerton look with the modern tailoring with a Regency vibe. <laughs> but don't do what I did and don't put it in stretch velvet. For men's costumes generally, I don't particularly like making men's costumes. <laughs> it's just not as fun for me. I like all of the frilly, flouncy, sparkly stuff. That's really what I love about costuming is um, making corsets and adding sparkles to things. That's my favorite parts of costuming. However, I like when Micah dresses up to go with me places sometimes. So while it won't be super frequent, there will occasionally be some costumes for Micah in the future, especially for the Renaissance Festival. <laughs> And that's pretty much it. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any opinions on tailoring and Regency tailoring and Regency silhouettes, then please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you guys. Like I said in the previous video, I am really not well versed in Regency men's clothing specifically. Um, we had a pretty comprehensive unit on Regency fashion generally and like the political implications of everything. However, men's fashion has always been a weak point in my fashion knowledge. So uh, if you'd like to educate me, please feel free to go ahead. <laughs> Um, and if you'd like to see the last part of this series where I'm going over my dress, then please subscribe and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye!